everybody and welcome back to Inspire the Podcast with myself, Nicola Wills. Today we have got a very special gentleman by the name of Melvin Odoom and I am just so excited for you to hear his story and his journey to where he is right now. So like with everybody, we start off with their bio. So Melvin has been a host on Radio 1 since April 2019. In 2021, he became the host of BBC Radio 1 Live Lounge show alongside Ricky Hayward Williams and Charlie Hedges. Melvin, alongside Ricky and Charlie, hosted the Kiss Breakfast show for 12 years. I remember that so well. They won silver at the Sony Radio Awards in 2009 and gold in 2012 within the most prestigious category, the Breakfast Show Award. In August 2016, Melvin featured on Strictly Come Dancing. I remember it so clearly, Melvin, sitting watching you on my screen. And unfortunately, Melvin actually was the first couple to be rejected from that show. But he did go on to win um, the Christmas, be the Christmas champion, didn't you, in 2016's show. In 2015, Melvin hosted the popular X Factor spin-off show, The Extra Factor, alongside his friend Rochelle Humes on ITV2. And Melvin has also presented the Brit Awards in 2010 alongside Ricky and also presented the BAFTAs alongside Kimberly Welsh, both for MTV1. Now, this is literally just the tip of the iceberg of the amazing things that Melvin has done. And what I love about this show is that you see and hear all of these things, you know, whether it's on social media or, you know, just the TV and you're featured on Saturday night and, you know, on the biggest radio show, like, in the whole of the UK. But for me, and I think for so many people, it's what it took to get there. Like, what is the story behind the Melvin O'Doom that we know and love today? So, Melvin, take me back. Yo. To where it all began. Yes, Nick. Thanks for having me on, first of all. Uh, it's great to chat to you. It's been a long time since I've seen you, so this is a lot of fun for me. Uh, so where did it start? It's probably started in a house in North London somewhere. Um, I was raised by two Ghanaian parents and I was always like the kid at family parties that wanted to entertain everyone. I loved the idea of of making people laugh and telling stories and making people smile. But I don't think I really knew what I wanted to be um, until I got to university. Yeah. And then talk to me about your home life. Like, have you got brothers, sisters? Yeah. So, um, I mean, my mum and dad split up when I was quite young. And um, my, so my mum raised myself and my sister, who I'm like super close to. I do have a half brother, but um, he was raised in Ghana and then in the States. So I didn't really grow up with him, but he's amazing as well. Um, and so like we kind of, I was kind of like torn between the whole like acting thing. And I wanted to be a singer and then realised I couldn't really hold a note and so I kind of fell into presenting once I got to university and which is where I met Ricky because he was he came from Brit school and he had all this knowledge of radio and he was like Melvin why don't you kind of like explore radio a bit more and I actually changed courses secretly without telling my mum because she wanted me to do something a little bit more academic and um yeah, so Rick's was doing media performance with radio. So I switched over to what he was doing. And then we started doing like student radio together. And that's how that kind of like partnership started. So, so nice. So basically he shaped the course of your career without meeting him. It would have been totally different. Yeah, I always say like me going to university was such a big deal because people were always like, oh, you know, he's is. Uh, the University of Bedfordshire, a good university. And I'm like, well, yeah, because if I didn't go there, I would have never met Ricky. There would be no Ricky and Melvin, which would have meant there would have been no Ricky, Melvin and Charlie, which would have meant we wouldn't have had that opportunity on Kiss Breakfast, which then led us to be on Radio 1. Um, so, yeah, like my me going to university was such a big deal. And at the time, it was actually um, a, a traumatic experience because I I didn't get the grades I wanted. I, I yeah I actually my first um my first choice was actually Brunel University and Royal Hampton they, they were my first choices I didn't get the grade so I actually went to university via clearing so that's when you call them up begging. and you're like do you have any places <laughs> yeah. left <laughs> yeah begging these are the these are the grades I've got like will you let me in um and luckily I got into Bedfordshire and did like a three-year course and to be honest with you Nick it was like one of the best moments of my life. I was just meeting new people every day. And I was, it was the first time I lived away from home. Like 
I loved being in my house and obviously my mom did a great job raising us, but it was the first kind of like taste of freedom that I had. And literally every single day I was meeting someone interesting, like like-minded and it was such a cool environment and I really enjoyed my course. And so just taking it back to your school life, do you, do you feel like, mm -hmm. you know, you needed to get out of London and that's why you wanted to go to university elsewhere? Like what was that? You know, was it a happy time as a child? School life was a, a funny one because um, I love drama. I love performing and big up my teacher, um, Mrs. Christopher, a.k.a. Mrs. Miss Yukumi. Like she saw something in me back then, which I probably didn't really know. And she begged my mum to let me do drama because of my mum was so... She was so protective of, of me because, you know, back then being a young black male, on TV, you had two examples. You had um, Trevor McDonald and you had Lenny Henry, right? So for me to say to my mum, I want to be on television, I want to perform, I want to entertain people, it was like almost unheard of. So we used to have like little arguments about, you know, what I should be doing in the future. She was like, go and work in a bank, be, you know, do something more academic, work in a hospital, be, become a doctor. That's very much like the West African, like, um, plan of action for your child. And so um, my teacher, I remember she kind of um, persuaded my mum to allow me to do A-level drama. And um, I promised my mum I'd do well. And then of course I didn't do well. And which is why I then had to beg to get into university. But, you know, back then I used to think, oh, mum, you know, she doesn't believe in me and she wasn't supportive. But actually she was super supportive because I always had a roof over my head I was never hungry. She was work like working at home to provide for me and my sister, raised both me and my sister. We always had an amazing warm house to live in. And so actually she provided this environment for me to flourish and for me to become comfortable in my own setting. And so, yeah, I'm so thankful for my mum and, and her work ethic. And, and she's actually one of my inspirations. But um, school was an interesting time, going back to that question, because... I loved the performance aspect and I had some really good friends, but at the same time I did get bullied. And um, I think that's probably one of the reasons why I like humor such, I always say my sense of humor is my weapon because I used to use it to protect me. Cause if you're making someone laugh, then they can't be bullying you. And um, there's one story that I remember where there's this kid that used to come and try and get his lunch money from me. Like, so he'd come to me and be like, Melvin, you need to give me some money for my lunch. And um, one day I was coming out of class and he used to have this watch on and he wore it backwards. So the face of the watch was kind of like on the on the palm side of, of his hand. And he punched me in my chest and, and the watch broke on my chest, right? And I remember feeling winded and he was like, you've got to pay for a new watch. You've broke my watch. My dad gave me that watch. And I was like terrified. I don't know why I was so scared. I used to hide in the theater at my school, like every lunch from this guy. And how old are you at this age? Uh, I must've been like 13, 14. This is like secondary school. And um, it's the funny thing is I've got mates who I'm still friends with now. So I told my friend Jasar about this a few years ago. And he said to me, Melvin, why didn't you tell me? And I was like, because I, 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 did, I didn't want to upset him because then I'd think, I thought if I was, if you weren't around, then he would really target me. Then he was like, Melvin, you should have told me. Oh, and Josiah's like this big guy. Like he would always play football. Josiah's like my boy. He's like my brother. And he was like, Melvin, you should have told me. And I was so scared. I was, I was so scared even after school. Because I remember when I, I uh, finished uni, my mate's girlfriend at the time, she was working for a, a well-known bank. And they were doing this massive initiative about bullying. And they were like, Melvin, you've just started working in radio. Because I think I was working behind the scenes at One Extra at the time. And she was like, you're doing really well for yourself. I know you're trying to become a presenter. And we're, we're trying to, you know, get people involved who may have been bullied at school and want to encourage them to, to, you know, share their stories and show that, you know, you, you know, you won't be bullied forever and you're not the only person going through it. And I was so still scared of this bully after school that I, I didn't want to be remembered or known as someone who'd been bullied because I just started my career. So I actually said, no, I didn't get involved. And I really do regret that now. But people don't 
understand the the power a bully has um and so I hate them I hate bullies yeah same I was bullied at school as well and <clears throat> and it's so strange because I had such an amazing experience at school but the things that you remember are the bad things that happened to you and they you just the lasting impact that that had on me you know for example everyone used to call me spam head and like I used to walk, <laughs> walk in this spam 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 and you know like I'm nearly 40 now and I would say for like 25 years after after school, I would wear a massive comb over fringe. Like even probably when I knew you, a fuel comb over because it was like, the, I, I had a spam head and um, I was Nicola with a spam head. And so this aggressive fringe just to cover it. like. See, and, and when I hear stuff like that, it's insane because I know you as, as such a confident, like outgoing person. Like I, I would have never you know, even imagine something like that could ha could happen to you. And also, I think a lot of them people were probably either A, jealous of you or B, fancied you. Yeah, and so <laughs> a, lot of the, a lot of the time, that's, you know, the way people show affection in the playground. It's just, you know, it's, it's what I call school school playground antics. Um, but it's it's weird how much you amplify things as a child and how much it, it can, it, it actually means to you and how it affects you in such a way. Um, so yeah, and if anyone in my family is bullied or whatever, it's like it's the one thing that really. Gets yeah, me. isn't there a really nice story about your niece? Yeah, so it's, um, my goddaughter um, actually. Yeah, so um, she was getting bullied, and it's really weird because of now kids don't just get bullied in the playground; they get bullied online. And she was getting bullied on on WhatsApp at the time, and so her mum called me up and she was like. Um, Melvin, like, just letting you know this is going on. And I was like, we'll just take her phone away. And, and she was like, well, it's not that easy, Melvin, because if you take your, her phone away, then she'll get bullied for not having a phone. It's like this mad, like, vicious circle. So I said, all right, you know what? Let me know when she's finishing school this term. And I'll, I want to pick her up from school, right? So at the time, I had this sick car, right? So I pulled up in front of the car, uh, pulled up in front of the school with the car parked up. I walked out and we were doing like kiss breakfast this time. So like literally everyone was listening. I walked through the playground. I'm getting little kids running up to me. Melvin, Melvin, can you give us a shout out? So I'm like, okay, cool. So I've gathered all these, these kids up. There's teachers around everything. And I've said, right, you see that girl over there? That is my goddaughter, right? So if you want to shout out, you need to ask her, right? And from that day on, everything changed. And it's just perspective on everything. And so, and that's like, for me, like she's an amazing, she's so smart and she's so beautiful and just so funny. There's no reason why she should be treated like that. There's no reason why any kid should be treated anyway. But if there's any way I can help, then I will. I just mean? love that. Oh, just owning that is just so gorgeous. It makes you so attractive, Melvin. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you've gone to university. You yeah. met Ricky, and then what was the first like radio station that you kind of started working on? How did that then go through to you having your big break? Wow, where do we begin? So we did student radio there. So we did something called Lut Luton FM, which was like uh, they call it a local RSL. So it's just it runs for a certain amount of time, and um, we did like our own like little versions of of, of radio shows where uh, we just played like really cool R and B and hip hop, and we got our friend. Charles, who was an, is still an amazing DJ. He used to work for Sony Street Team. So he used to like do these mixes. We used to do pranks, all sorts. And that's where probably Ricky and Melvin was first born. Then I finished uni and Ricky was doing work experience everywhere. He was doing it at, um, at Choice at the time, which is now Capital Extra. He worked for Radio One. He worked for One Extra. He was literally working for every single station. And I was broke. <laughs> And so I moved back home and my old school teacher got me a job as a drama teacher at Tower Hamlets College. And then my friend Damien Plummer got me a job as a youth worker. So I was working with young people and I remember being really grateful to have the job, but frustrated that I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. I wanted to present. And um, so I went back to uni. I went back to uni and I said to my teacher, 
or my tutor, like, what should I do? I'm like, I've tried to go for jobs in radio and I've got no experience. No one really cares. I've got, you know, I've not worked in a proper TV studio or radio uh, station before. So like, what should I do? And she was like, well, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I'm working with young people. And she goes, cool. So you're working with young people. And what did you learn at uni? And I said, well, like performance and presenting and broadcasting. She goes, okay. So she was like, try and merge the two somehow. And I was like, what do you mean? She goes, have you ever thought about kids TV? And I was like, kids TV? Like, I want to do cool stuff like Richard Blackwood's doing on MTV. <laughs> and so I went away. And weirdly enough, I had a call from someone who worked on CBBC who was on my course, a girl called um, uh, Chanel Robinson. And she was like a, a researcher and runner at the BBC. And she was like, Melvin, I'm working on this show called Dick and Dom in the Bungalow. I can't pay you, but if you want to come down and do some like random characters on there, it will be great for you to see how studio works and what we do here. And, you know, they might call you back, whatever. So I was like, you know what? I'm not doing anything else on my weekends. Let's just do it. So I went down and they were like dressing this crazy animal suit and just start dancing. <laughs> and my grand used to say to me, whatever you do in life, do it to the best of your ability. It doesn't matter how big or small, just do it well. I always remember my grand used to say that. So I went on this set and Nick, I was shocking out <laughs> doing robot, all these crazy moves. No one could see my face. I was thinking, I'm just going to go crazy. Like no one's going to care. And so I did my dance. I was literally on set for about, I don't know, like five minutes, came off. Uh, the the uh, presenters, Rich and Dominic were like, Melvin, that was hilarious. Um, and then the main, like, big producer came down and was like, that was so funny. Do you want to come back? And I was like, okay. He goes, look, we can't pay you, but we'll pay for your bre breakfast. We'll pay, uh, pay for your travel. Everything will be fine. And uh, I was like, cool, let's do it. And so I used to come every week and then the show got bigger and bigger and bigger. So it moved from like BBC two to BBC one. Then the show got even bigger. Then they started like winning BAFTAs. Then the show got even bigger. Then they started used to they they, they started getting like um, guests like celebrities. Then it got even bigger. Then they got other actors like real actors. So they got a guy called um, Ian Kirkby who like went to like a proper acting school. And then they had a guy called um, Dave Chapman who studied with at Jim Henderson's like puppetry school, and he went to like a a drama school. like this amazing guys, and they taught me so much and. Just the show got bigger and bigger and bigger, but then I was always part of it because I was kind of there from the start. So then they started paying me and I think I ended up doing the show for like five years. Oh, wow. And this was all before radio? It was kind of happening simultaneously. So when I was like, kind of, let's say like second, third year into like CBBC, then I got a job as a broadcast assistant at One Extra, which Ricky got me. Um, and so like, I was kind of doing them at the same time. So I was kind of getting this experience of TV work and but then at the same time learning how to be a producer. So I, I saw how radio w worked and then I got to work with amazing people like Ace and Viz and Rampage and Robbo Ranks and um, um, just all these amazing broadcasters who some of them are still on the radio now, like Benji B, like I worked on Benji B show. Um, and then people like Shawnee B, who are still on air now. Like, so this is like about 15, 16 years ago. So y you take all your favorite bits from all these broadcasters and then you apply it to yourself. So then when we, when we got the opportunity at KISS, it was like, okay, now we get to, to be in front of the microphone. Um, and we didn't really, we just didn't put any, um, we didn't put any pressure on ourselves. We were just like, we've got this opportunity. And we'll see what happens because the boss at Kiss there, a guy called Andy Roberts, he gave us this opportunity. He was just like, I'm going to put you on a, like a, uh, almost like a test period. Like we're going to give you a test run for like a few months during the summertime. And if you're good, you can stay and I'll find a place to put you. And if not, then I'm going to cut you off. Cause like commercial radio is like, they're savage. And so me and Ricky never thought, we were just like, you know what, we'll be here for as long as we'll be here for and see what happens. But then, we started doing weekend breakfast and then we depth for all these other DJs. And then eventually the breakfast show host at the time left. And then they were like, let Ricky and Melvin cover for a bit. But then when we covered the, the listening figures went up. Amazing. So me and Ricky went on holiday. Actually, we, we went to Ibiza, which is where you you're now. And, um, 
we came back from Ibiza and there was like an article in the paper saying these new kids have come out of nowhere and the ratings have gone up and we were just like, what is going on? And then we just, and then they paired us with Charlie and then that was it. That was, that was it. Kiss Breakfast was born. That was, it was just, it was mad. That is mad. And do you know, I love, I love hearing you talk about dressing up as a dinosaur <laughs> and doing yeah, these things yeah. because obviously people would see you now like super cool, like, you know, with all the like best celebrities, the best DJs. But the reality is, you know, you're Mr. Dinosaur. It's you're the same person, and but you weren't too cool. Do you know what's hilarious? Is I will do a gig, Nick, right? And um, I'll get like a, an 18 year old guy or girl and they'll come up and they'll be like, oh, Melv, can I get a picture? And I'll, and I'll be like, oh, so what do you know me from? Is it like um, Radio One? Is it MTV? Is it Extra Factor? They're like, nah, 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 Dick and Dom in the bungalow. <laughs> Like, because if you, you forget the effect that you have, yeah. like, on young people. Because yeah. I remember the, the shows that I used to watch, like, as a kid, like, Going Live. Going Live, I love that. Stuff. Do you remember all them shows? Yeah. So you forget the effect that you have on, on young people. And, and those young people now are adults. So I've got, like, this new wave of, of, like, audience members that used to watch me, like, back in the day. And you're right. It's Sometimes it's not those, it's not my cool jobs that people remember. It's, like, yeah. the stuff where I was dancing around with custard in my hair. Yeah, exactly. Or, like, getting, like, mushy peas thrown in my face. That's the things that, those are the things that people remember. It's, it's hilarious. So every job, that's what I'm saying, every job you do is so important. Yeah, and I just love that advice that your grand gave you. Like, whatever job you're doing, and I think this applies to all industries, doesn't it? You know, if you're just, just the waitress or just the bin man or whatever, if you do that to the best of your ability and you show up every day and give it 100%, the only way is you can elevate. It, you will get better and you will yeah. get promoted and seen and all the things. And the fact of the matter is everyone's role is important. If, if someone, if there's a missing link somewhere in the chain, then everything goes to shit. Like it's, it's just ruined. So every, every person's role is so important. It doesn't matter how big or small you think it is. It's, it's very important. Melvin, you're so positive. Like you ooze positivity. Where does that come from? Um, excuse me. <laughs> uh, it's, it comes from being fed. If I'm, if I'm not fed, I'm hungry. Um, no, you know what? I just think, I think it's too much effort to be upset. And if I'm completely honest with you, Nick, like the only people that see me upset are the people who I'm super close to, like my mum or my sister. Like it's it's rare that because if they're the only people that can forgive you if you're in a mood or whatever. And I think my role in life is to make people happy. Like that is my job. I don't I don't sit here and go I am the best broadcaster in the world. I never say I'm the best presenter in the world, but people love working with me. People like having me in a room. People feel comfortable when I'm around. I, I'd go out of my way to make people feel comfortable. I would never want anyone to feel like, oh, the, Melvin's coming. I, I'm, I don't want to sit in the same room as him. And sometimes, you know, when people ask me for advice about how to make it in this industry, I go work hard and be nice. That's literally it. Those are your two main ingredients. And if you want to add to that, don't give up. I can actually vouch for that because obviously this is really brand new in my podcasting experience and you were the one, first, one of the first people I reached out to and you've been nothing but supportive and encouraging and giving great advice. And, you know, like I'm no one in comparison to what you've achieved and everything. And it's just so, so grateful and so, um, so special. So thank you so much for that. Um, so growing up, Melvin, Tell me about who did you look up to? Like, who were your idols? Who did you want to be like? That's a great question. There's a few people. I always say, like, I've got a few um, people who I admire. So I'm going to start off with the cheesy one. And that's my mum. Just because I just think she's done an amazing job raising, like, myself and my sister. She did it single-handedly. Like, I just feel like mums in general don't get any credit. Like, my sister is... She's an actress as well and she's got kids at home and she'll still do like auditions and I'll go and help out for the weekend and I'm shattered. And I'm like, I just got, I've got so much respect for, and not just mums, for, for dads as well, just parents in general. I just think they do such an amazing job at raising their children. And I think my mum, she was incredible at raising us and 
uh, working at the same time and always being, because my mum's funny. I think my mum's joke, she's always so positive and she's always like the life and soul of the party. But she's also got these values like that I love. She's always, she always makes people feel welcome. It doesn't matter who you're from, who, who you are and where you're from. She will always make you feel like at home. And I actually think that's like a Ghanaian thing, which is where my parents are from. If you go to Ghana, if you, have you ever been to Ghana before? If you were to go, they they make you feel at home, Ghanaians, like straight away. And and I, I love that about my mum. So her work ethic and just her attitude to life in general, I, I get that from mum. Then... There's people kind of like in the celebrity realm. So there's there's two people in terms of when it comes to broadcasting. So the first person is Trevor Nelson. So I remember working in a stock room in North London, Ravel's, and I used to sell shoes and I used to listen to Trevor on Saturdays and Sundays. So I used to have a show called Rhythm Nation. Um, and he he just, I just used to love his passion for music and he cared about what he did and he had the best stories and he hasn't changed. He's that the Trevor Nelson that I listened to like 20 years ago is the same Trevor that we've got now. But what people don't realize is how he has navigated through this industry and remained relevant, which is in itself incredible. Um, and I really admire that. And I try and emulate that as best I can when it comes to Trev. And I remember when we first started working at the BBC, like at, at work, he's known as Uncle Trev. Because he's the he's the guy you respect in the building, right? And I remember when you know I first came into contact with him, and I was like, "This is Trevor Nelson, like he's here." And he we had met him before, like he'd done gigs at our uni, and he'd come out in the crowd and dance and everything. And so, like when I was in the same building, I, I felt like, "Wow, we'd landed." This felt like an achievement in itself to be in the same building as one of you know my heroes. He is a hero, um, and. I can sit in a studio and have a conversation with him now. And that makes me, and Trevor's probably so bored of the amount of times me and Ricky mention him in interviews and in things like this, but he's, you know, but he's still mad humble about it and so cool about it. And I was actually, I listened to a clip of a documentary that he did with Annie Mack the other day and, um, and thinking about it, I knew this, but I didn't realize until he said it in this podcast, but he said he was on radio one, one extra and radio two all at the same time he's like the only broadcaster to have been able to do that so there would have been a moment when he would have been speaking to someone's child then their parent then their grandparent like all in the same week which is like who does that what broadcaster can say that they can do that and so yeah trevor for me is absolute g um and then my other person is don't derma o'leary Derma is the nicest person in show business. He is, he will never forget a name. He makes presenting look easy. He look, makes it look like child's play. Um, but he always makes time for people. And he's just, again, remained nice. I like to be around nice people. I like to be liked. And so, yeah, like Derma O'Leary for me is, and he's he's got that, for me, I think it's a real blessing if you can do tv and radio at the same time and he does that do you mean so when you know when people go melvin you know what would you like to do in the future i always like go well more of the same but you know i'd like to remain on tv and have a presence on radio at the same time because i love both i think there's pros and cons to both um and i think dermot does that really really well so yeah those are my two heroes and then my final one um which people might find controversial is will smith because when when we we've met Will, we've been lucky enough to meet him a few times. And when you meet Will Smith, he goes out of his way to give you the best. And when I say that, I'm not saying just the best interview, the best interaction, the best everything. He give he will give you the best. So I'll give you an example, right? When you go and interview most celebs, they they'll you'll interview them in something which is called a junket. So it's a room full of journalists and then you're going to like a room or a hotel room or a studio and you interview that person. Then there's a, a queue of you guys, right? Generally, most celebs will just sit in their room and then you come to them. Will would come to the room, literally welcome everyone that's come to see him, say thank you for coming, then go and sit in the room. 
This particular junket was done on a boat on the Thames, right? I don't know why, I can't remember why, but he wanted to make it different, right? Me and Ricky walk in. As soon as we sat down, we hear this weird noise in the background. Like, so as soon as me and Ricky like get into our first question, we look at each other like our, our interview's ruined. We can't stop this. We're not, we're not big enough to stop an interview with Will Smith. So we're, we know we've got a bad interview because there's this random noise in the background, like an engine or something. Anyway, Will says, hold up, hold up, hold up. Stop the cameras. I want Ricky and Melvin to have a good interview. So we're going to wait for that noise to stop. He stopped all the cameramen. Yep. He was like, guys, you can just take a break. And then he started chatting to us about trainers. He, start, he told us stories about the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. He introduced us to his manager at the time. And he just made us feel comfortable about even breaking. Then the noise stopped. He was like, boys, you ready? We were like, yeah. He was like, cameramen, you ready? They were like, yeah. And then we just started again. Best interview. Will goes out of his way to give you the best. And so um, I, always, I always said, look, I, I might not be, be as big as Will ever in my life, but if people are want to speak to me or people want to take a picture or people want to chat to me or interact, I will try and give them my version of the best. Because of when Will did that for us, it brightened up my whole day. And on the flip, I've had experiences where people that I love and admire in that world have made me feel terrible. And it does have an effect on you. And so like, that's something that I take from Will. Like, if I can do something and make someone feel happy and go that extra mile, I'll do that. Amazing. And I am such a big fan of his. I just think he is amazing. And, and you can see that it's like the kindness and the goodness that he oozes. You can't last that long in a career and not be that person. Most people are nice. You're right. And, and you're right. I think for longevity, you know, there's, there'll be a point. If you're, if you're a horrible person, people will find that out eventually. And especially now with social media, you can't, it's not like them and us. Like we're all kind of merged now. We all, you know, that curtain has gone and people yeah. want to see, they want to see the reality, they want to see you. And so if, if you are like kind of faking it, it's going to be ripped down quite quickly. Definitely. So Melvin, tell me about the, the worst time in your life. Remember you were sharing with me how through the COVID times and just how bad that was for you. And especially with your relationship with your mum, how close you were. Um, yeah, so a really tough time in my life was quite recently would, would have been lockdown. And I'm sure it was for a lot of people. Um, I always thought I was quite a homely person until lockdown. I thought I loved my own company, but then I kind of realized quite quickly that I love being around people. So in the first half of lockdown, I had my housemate, a guy called Leroy, who's incredible, like really cool guy. Again, a brother to me, right? In the second part, he had moved out. Um, and prior to that, like my mom got really ill with COVID. Now she's got asthma and she's also a care worker. And you know, around that time, the care homes were the first places that got targeted when it came to like, well, which were affected when it came to, to COVID. And so at that point, we had no idea what was going on. And I've got this friend called Nina, an amazing person who works at a children's hospital. And she told me how I should cover myself up. I remember like pulling up at my mum's, covering my head, my hands, everything, and asking her to get into the car. She couldn't even walk. And then we went to like a test center and they're just supposed to test you and then tell you if you've got COVID or not. And this guy was like, your mom has to get out of the car now. And then an ambulance just appeared and they took my mom and they were like, you can't speak to her. You can't go into the hospital. You can't visit all this stuff. She didn't have a charger for her phone. So we were like, how are we going to get hold of her? And then it was just like this really scary time where we didn't really know what was going to happen. Um, but my mom is an absolute soldier and she's fine now. But I just remember thinking to myself, like I, f I felt quite helpless around that time. And I think a lot of people did. Um, and then obviously soon after that was all the stuff that happened with George Floyd. And um, I don't know, for the first time, because I've got this an amazing unit of friends, from, both from school, my cousins and from university. And I always felt like when stuff upset me, 
I would tell them straight away. And for some reason, when it came to like my mum, I couldn't open up because I didn't want to have to relive it when I explained the story each time. Um, and so I didn't say anything for ages. I think I told Ricky and Charlie, but I think I told Ricky and Charlie because I knew I'd have to interact with them still every single day when we did our show. And I thought it was important for them to know what was going on, like behind the scenes. But yeah, I didn't tell anyone for ages. And it feels like such a stupid thing because of like my boys have your back. They've got your whole backbone. And the moment I told them, I felt relieved and they were like doing this and doing that. And I didn't have to worry, but I just found it really hard to open up. And um, it's so silly because a few years ago when I was, when I was quite young, we had a friend in our, in our circle who is, uh, he was like just a joker in the crew. And um, one day my mom came to my, my room and she was like, your friend's taken his life. And I remember having these mixed emotions of, at first I didn't believe my mom because this guy was just like proper, proper joker in the crew. And secondly, I've obviously felt sadness, but then I was like, why didn't he come to us? Because we, we were all there. Like we're all, and we're, a lot of us are still tight now. And I, I, I think people don't value the power of just letting things out and speaking and talking, talking about things. And so, yeah, I, I, at that time I didn't take my own advice. And as soon as I did talk about it, I felt so, so good about it. But yeah, the, mum being ill and then everything that was going on with George Floyd was just a lot. It was, it was heavy. And I think for me, it's, um, my job is to always be positive as you know, and my job is to always be this happy guy. And for, I remember that week when all that stuff was going on, I did, I didn't feel happy. I felt, I felt like people hated black people. I felt like that. I felt like, why and I, I and I didn't I didn't know how to communicate and I was almost exhausted because it, it's actually not a new thing to me like I can't tell you how many times I've opened up social media and heard a story about like a young black kid in the states or here and their lives have been taken like way too soon and so by the time that had happened I just felt exhausted and so yeah all these different things were happening and all at the same time but like I said, I've got this amazing unit of friends and family that have do have me and do have my back. And so, yeah, I've got, luckily I've got that support system. But I do remember thinking this isn't this isn't a, a great time in my life. And so sometimes I know everyone gets over stuff, but sometimes I think it's important for us to remember like what we've got. Like if you're in a club now or in a bar now and you are upset about the music's not good enough or the decor's not great. People forgot that we couldn't leave our house. People forgot that we couldn't see our family members, you know? Our memories are too short, way too short. It's, for me, it's insane. And I think because of it, it like, because for, for lockdowns, for, lockdown for some people was great, actually. And I think for some people, they, don't, they didn't even have that experience. But I, I did. And so, like, my memories of it were, oh, okay, so this is happening. All right. Well, I think I can get through it. And then it just got mad messy. And then I was just so happy that we got through it. And so, yeah, I'm so grateful for like the stuff, everything that's going on now. Like when I get jobs, I literally say yes to everything because <laughs> as I remember what we was going through. Um, so yeah, but lockdown, I was not a fan of the second half of it. And Melvin, have you ever experienced racism? Um, yeah. Um, like loads of times it's and it's mad when I say it like that because um because I say it like it's it's a normal thing like it's acceptable but um it's funny because we me and Ricks were asked this question around the after the George Floyd stuff because someone was doing a project and they were like do you experience racism and I was like to Ricks no nah, no nah, we're all right and Ricky looked at me like what are you talking about and um and it's sometimes there's, it's these minor things, it's the, the microaggressions. But yeah, I, I, I was saying 
Rick's was like, Melvin, how many times have you been stopped by the police? And I was like, I didn't think of it that way. And I was, I was chatting to my friend, like a English person. And, and uh, I said, how many times has your dad been stopped by the police? And they were like, never. Never, yeah. Mine hasn't. I haven't. Uh, I, I, for fun, I asked some of my white friends to see what they say. And they go like, maybe once, twice or never. And that to me is mad. Because I can't tell you how many times I've been stopped by the police. I can't. I couldn't tell you. And and do they stop you and then know who you are and they be like, oh, don't worry about it. There was one time I got stopped near mine, and the policeman asked for my photo. He said that my tires were low, like, and I was like, I like I'm a big car fan, so I know as soon as he stopped me, I was like, why are you stopping me? And I feel anxious anyway if there's a policeman any, anyway. So I, I I drive mad slow and like I do whatever they want, pull up to the side, and um. So he was like asking silly questions and then midway through he was like, you're Ricky Melvin and Charlie, aren't you? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, why did you leave Kiss and go to Radio 1? And I was like, why is he asking me these random questions? And then he was like, can I get your picture? And I was like, cool. Then he takes his picture and as, he's, as he pulls his phone out, he also shows me a photo of Trevor Nelson, right? Who he also stopped. So I go to work the next week and I go, Trev, did you get stopped by the police? He's like, yeah, Melv. And I said, and what else did he do? He goes, he took a picture of me, bro. Like, so we, we were laughing about it, but actually it's mad unacceptable. It's crazy. Like who else, who else would have to go through that? And this was, this is when we were doing the evening show. So I was coming back at like midnight. I was on the road like nighttime. So to be stopped going home at like midnight by a policeman, for no reason, because he wants to take a photo, is a madness. And I've just been stopped randomly anyway. When I was a kid, when I was 16, me and my um, cousin went to change some money at a local pub. And all these police vans just came out of nowhere and we got stopped and they searched us. And I remember feeling really embarrassed. And my cousin's from South, so he kind of was like, whatever. And um, I remember being so upset by it, I kept asking. Because I'm a tiny guy, but I've got a big mouth. So I kept asking, why have you stopped me? And he was like, it's a routine check. And I was like, yeah, but why? And he was like, sir, just calm down. It's a routine check. I was like, yeah, but why have you stopped me and my cousin? Like, what have we done wrong? And he was like, if you've got an issue, you can take it to this person, da, 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 go to the police station. And my cousin was trying to calm me. He's like, Melvin, just chill, just chill, just Melvin, chill, 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 chill. And I remember walking away and me and, me and my cousin, Jay, Joseph, we, we all, we can chat about anything. Like he called me the other day just to say hello and it ended up being like an hour conversation. Like we talk, right? And so I remember when we walked away from that van for a good few minutes, it was silence because we'd realized what had happened and why it had happened. And so when I hear people go, there ain't no racism in the UK. <laughs> I'm like, you have no idea. Like, some people have no idea, but I just don't sit here and bang on about it. And I don't allow it to define me and I don't allow it to affect me. I haven't got time for it. Do not have time, but it's there and I'm aware, like, don't get it twisted. I'm fully aware. And it's sometimes it's, it's minor things like, you know, you might not be in a certain position. I remember approaching, I'm not going to say the company, but I remember approaching a certain place and uh, I was really excited, excited to be part of this certain place. And I was probably the, one of the best interviews I've ever done in my life. And they were like, we're, we're going to call you back for a second interview. And then they called me afterwards, like the week after. And they were like, you know what? We spoke to our execs and they were like, they were like, uh, we just think you're a little bit too urban for what we do here. And I was like, what does that mean? What's urban mean? Yeah. Yeah, what is what I'm too urban me. So, you know, and that was from a reputable company that still exists now. Do you know what I mean? I'm not gonna blow them up. That's not how I do that's not how I do business. But these things happen all day long. People don't realise. Um and so that's why I really celebrate our young presenters now, because they can be their unapologetically black selves. The your young fillies, your chunkses, your ZZ Millses, your Yinkers, like these amazing black broadcasters who are allowed to be black 
I'm so like excited for them. Do you mean this is an, a new era? Um, and it's celebrated now. But back then, I think, I think me and me and Ricky had to dilute ourselves. Our, well, not ourselves, but our blackness. Do you mean at times? But um, at the same time, we've been given amazing opportunities, and we took them, and we've worked with some amazing people, and we've been blessed. So I focus on that. So Melvin, tell me, what is the best piece of advice you have ever been given? It's, it's probably from Dermot O'Leary. So um, I remember we had an interview with him and he, and I'm talking about this all the time. And I asked him if he ever gets nervous when he hosts the NTA Awards, because it seems like such a big award ceremony. And you're in front, you're, and you're in front of loads of other um, broadcasters and actors and people who are just talented in this massive venue. And I was like, surely that's, you know, nerve wracking. And he was like, Melvin, if I'm prepared, then I'm excited. I'm so excited to be there. And it's, it just goes back to that old saying is, uh, and it says, um, failure to prepare is preparation for failure. So now I over prepare anything. If I, if I get a job tomorrow, I'm ask my agents get so upset with me because I literally ask for scripts like every day. When can I see a script? Can I see a script now? I do it with my producer now at Radio One. So like, that's just how I operate. Cause I like to know what I need to do, when I need to do it. And when it's happened, all of that stuff, the more information and more knowledge I have, the more power until I feel comfortable about what I'm doing, then I'm just nervous. It makes me feel uneasy. So yeah, preparation for failure is no failure. For, failure to prepare is preparation for failure. Love it. And what is the worst piece of advice you've ever received? Uh, um, it's from my mate. I wonder if he even knows, remembers this. So I remember when we did a demo years ago and it was probably we were trying to get on the BBC. So we, when we were working at one extra, um, we, we won this competition, which got us signed to a company called something else. And, um, the prize was to make a demo, right? So we made this demo and we played it to various people at the BBC. And to be fair, I just think on paper, there were already loads of young black male duos on the radio, especially on One Extra. So you had Rampage, you had Ace and Viz, you had Jason and Yare, you had a lot of male black duos from London on the station already. So they probably were like, well, we just, we can't sign another one type thing. Um, so anyway, I played this demo to one of my friends and he said, Melvin, you don't have a voice for radio. <laughs> he was like, Melvin, you've got, you've got a great sense of humor, you've got cool stories, but I don't like your voice. <laughs> And, I was, and this is someone that I, you know, admire now and he is massively successful. But that's why sometimes in life, you just don't listen to people. You just got to do what you're doing. I think you have, it's okay to listen to certain people, but I think you, the, the person you have to listen to the most is yourself. And I remember at the time at, um, at One Extra, I don't know if I should say her name, no, I'm going to say it. So MIA used to send music to us all the time. And it was when she first started. And I couldn't even tell you the signal. I couldn't even tell you the single, sorry. But um, all over the po post room floor, there were people that had listened to the single and just like, either they tried to chuck it away or whatever, but there were copies of this single like everywhere, but not in pe on people's desks. No one was really feeling it, right? Anyway, fast forward to... I don't know, seven years later, this girl was on the Slumdog Millionaire soundtrack. She was on stage performing with Jay-Z, Kanye West, Rihanna. She's got number one single around the world. And I was just like, if she had ever walked into our office that day and saw her sing single on the floor, that might have just like, crushed her dreams that may have made her feel like oh man like people aren't maybe i should give this up and so that's why i always say you just got to believe in in what you're doing if if you have a genuine belief that you're good at what you do and you can do it like genuinely you think that then just do it and and actually it's okay to listen to everyone else but the person that gets that final say is you that's that's it 
And so, yeah, I listened to what my friends said, but I was like, well, I hear what you're saying, but I still like doing radio. So, Melvin, what is next for you? Like, you've achieved so much. Do you have dreams, like, within you that you still want to make come true? Yeah, I get asked this question a lot. Um, I, I've got it. So, two things. So, I'm going to quote P. Diddy when he used to say, don't talk about it, be about it. I remember years ago when I did a, a project with someone and they promised me the world. They were like, Melvin, if you do this job, you're going to be one of the biggest presenters in the UK. And I remember being on a family holiday. I cut that holiday short to come back to the UK and work with this guy. And we filmed all this footage until this day. I never saw it. And so I never wanted to be the type of per person that spoke about stuff. And then it never happened. I'd prefer you to switch on your phone and go on social media or pick up a, a paper or turn your TV and go, rah, is that what Melvin's doing now? Okay. Like, I rarely talk about the projects that I'm doing. You'll just see me doing it. Um, and I'm really lucky to be doing loads of fun stuff with fun people. So I always say more of the same. I always say more of the same, but bigger. Because of I think what I'm doing is quite fun. Um, and I, I suppose the only box I haven't ticked off, which you have, is the family box. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Like the one thing my mum and every other elder in my family goes on about is when am I going to have grandkids? When are you going to settle down and get married and this and that? And so, yeah, I think I've been so focused on the work thing that I haven't ticked off the, you know, the settling down box. And that's something that I would love to do in the next few years, not even next few years, in the near future. Tomorrow. Do you mean, I think it's time. I'm getting grey ha hairs in my beard now. It's time to, to chill. And I've had, I've had my fun. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I'd like. You're ready. I love that. And so with every guest, I always ask them the same question for the final question. And that is, what advice would you give to your younger self? Um, great question. So... The advice I would give to my younger self would be buy property early, definitely, and learn about it as well. Learn property. That's something I always say. I w if, I, if I was the head teacher of a school, I would have a class where you learn about how to buy a house. It sounds like the dumbest thing, but actually that was the hardest thing that I did that was probably the biggest deal for me. Like buying property and if I had instead of buying cars like one after the other if I just put money aside and put a massive deposit down on a house I would be bawling right now so yeah I would tell my younger self to, to buy property early and the other thing is focus on the positives I think as human beings if you get one tiny bit of negativity, it's really easy for you to, to focus on that. I remember doing a show called Lego Masters a few years ago for Channel 4. And I remember when they asked me to do it, I was like, how come you, you guys are asking me to do this show? Because, you know, I used to love Lego as a kid, but I wouldn't say I'm an expert. And the um, producer was like, Melvin, we just love your energy. And we love that you're the eyes of the audience. So when you see these amazing builds, you look excited and we want, you know, our audience to be excited and you are the audience. You're the eyes of the audience of this show, right? And I was like, okay, cool. So I started doing this show. We'd learn my scripts, we'd, you know, do my thing. And we we shot the series and it went out. And, you know, I, I, I thought, you know, and I did the stupid thing of looking online. So I looked online first week. Yeah, this is fun. How come a show has, like this hasn't been made before? I love Lego. All these amazing tweets like, and, and Instagram messages. And then I saw maybe two or three bad ones. One person said, Melvin's talking too fast. Another person said, Melvin's too loud. Another person said, why is Melvin not as funny as he is on The Breakfast Show? Right? That killed me. <laughs> like, like, because I think we're so used to having positive tweets. And actually... When people are negative to like me, Ricky and Charlie, two things happen. One, it's all of us. So it never feels as, um, it doesn't feel as targeted and it doesn't feel like it's just, you're the only person that it's, it's, you know, um, 
aimed at. Whereas this show was just me hosting it, right? So when I got that message, I remember freaking out. I messaged my agent. I was like, oh my God, do you think I should have done this show? It, it was literally free messages, right? And I remember I put my phone down. I didn't look at any more. And then my agent messaged me was like, what are you talking about? I've just watched the show. It's really good. It's entertaining. Um, and then the next morning, I got an email from the exec producer. And she was like, for a new show, that is the best response we've had from social media ever in my career. And she was like, well done, congratulations. And I had loads of positive feedback. And it's just mad how much negative, negative interactions can affect you. Because of the, I, I literally disregarded, it was hundreds of positive messages and it, I saw three bad ones. And I was like, oh. And so, yeah, just focus on the positive in every aspect of your life. Because there's going to be negative all day long. And you can't please everyone. In fact, the bigger you get, the more haters you get. And I think I, I learned that the hard way because it was the first time I felt like I, I was doing something just myself. Like something that big myself. Because I've always been with either Ricky or Charlie or Rochelle. Like I've always been with someone. And so that felt like, oh, this is you doing it. This is your, you know, you're leading this, Mel. So it felt like quite, I don't know, targeted when people were saying bad stuff. So yeah, just focus on the positives. You, you can't please everyone. Keep it moving. I totally, totally get that. And to quote my favourite film, Pretty Woman, <laughs> mm -hmm. She always says, the bad things are easier to believe. And it's so true. It's true. Like, and bad news travels faster. Yeah. It's mad. It's actually weird. And, you know, it, I think we all experience that, especially now being so, you know, we're so heavy on social media. You, you, I, you, I feel all the love and I feel all the love and the one person just might say and literally anything about my appearance or what I'm saying or, you know, how I'm living my life. And, and then I can't sleep at night because that person has, has opinion has affected me. So, you know, how people who then actually experience, you know, tr proper trolls, like I've never had anything like that before. Um, and I know that you haven't not on that larger scale, but you can see how people get to that point where they just can't keep going you know it's it's horrific and I hope that one day especially within our our like next few years of our time that we see that massively clamped down on because it's just not good enough yeah I mean I can talk about that issue another day we'll be here all day long if I start on that but yeah I I personally think the technology already exists do you mean if you can if you can work out if I'm not paying a subscription for something you can work out if there's certain keywords that shouldn't be like broadcasted or posted on, on social media. There's certain words that shouldn't be even allowed to be written on social media, but you can. So you have to ask your question, well, why? See what I'm saying? But we'll talk about uh, that another day. That's another, that's another podcast, series two. Yeah. <laughs> but Melvin, it has been my greatest pleasure interviewing you thank you for making me feel so relaxed and so calm and so <laughs> no, thank you. like just really enjoying oh enjoying my time speaking with you like it is so new to me and you've just been such a champion of mine um i know you know, just for myself just this last hour speaking to you i have taken so many things away and i know that the listeners are gonna you know just get so much from this and you know most importantly be inspired by your story to from where you are from where you were, sorry, to where you are today. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And we'll see you soon. Thanks for having me, Nick. My pleasure.